Hi, this is Eric Prostowski. Welcome to another segment of EP on EP. It's a particular pleasure for me today to have a friend for many years with me, Dr. Peter Coey, who is a professor of medicine at uh, Jefferson, but also many years at Lankanaw, and he's now the emeritus, emeritus uh, past chair of cardiology, if I have that right, Peter. That sounds good. Uh, Peter could talk about many things, but there's a specific uh, area of expertise he has that very few of us uh, um, can share uh, from our own experience, and that's with the FDA, Peter. So I'd like to concentrate today, if I could, on, on sort of your perceptions of what's going on now as far as drug approval. And let's start with the antirhythmic drug. So no one better than you can tell us what's hot. I mean, it seems like we haven't had a new antirhythmic drug in, in eons. Tell us what, what, what's going on. Well, it, you're, you're absolutely right. Uh, antirhythmic drug development has been stalled for quite some time. It, part of it is because, um, a large part of it is because how expensive it is and how complicated it is to bring a new antirhythmic drug forward. And, uh, Can you maybe elaborate just briefly on that? I don't think people have any idea of the duration of time and the money. Yeah, the, the, uh, the duration is variable, but it can run anywhere between 8 to 12 years. And the cost somewhere between one to two billion dollars to bring a one new chemical billion? billion dollars to bring a new chemical entity from the from the bench all the way out to wow. approval and, and marketing. So uh, the FDA obviously has been very concerned about the safety of antirhythmic drugs, and so they've been asking for more outcomes trials in the, in that space. And as you know, a outcomes trials in atrial fibrillation are quite difficult, uh, which is the principal focus of drug development. But the good news is that people, there are still a lot of persistent people who are, are trying to find new ways to treat patients with arrhythmias. And what we're seeing actually, and Jeremy here at this meeting talked a little bit about new methods of delivery for some of the older drugs. So uh, inhaled flecainide right. or sniffed verapamil, uh, for example, or uh, a, a patch that you can put on the surface of the heart that elutes amiodarone at the time of open heart surgery so that you can wow. get eliminate post-operative atrial fibrillation. People are being very creative in trying to come up with new ways to deliver drugs that we've had around for a while. So, um, care to give us a hint of any drugs that you have seen in the pipeline that you're a little excited by? Oh, there, there are lots of new ideas. Uh, unfortunately, none of them have really gotten into phase three. I mean, we okay. haven't really had a new antirhythmic drug in development in phase three since probably Uh So it's, it's not going to be soon. Uh, but on the other hand, if you're developing a, a, a known chemical entity, like flecainide, for example, the safety burden really isn't as large as it is for a new chemical entity. So it, it's possible that these development programs will speed along relatively quickly. That sounds great. So let's talk about the FDA a little bit. I know that a primary concern of theirs is safety. Uh, not just with antirhythmic drugs, but with others. Can you tell us kind of what are their new safety questions? Well, th this whole thing about the safety of non-cardiac drugs really began to take shape, I think, and really come into focus with the diabetes medicines. You remember all the oh, flap yeah. about the yeah. Vandia, for example, right. and all the difficulty that we had with rosiglitazone. And that really started the process of the FDA thinking about what do you need to do with a new drug in any, for any indication, whether it be for diabetes or a rheumatologic disease or uh, uh, for a common cold, how much data do you need to have to prove that the drug does not have a cardiac safety liability? And, and this is really true in oncology. You know a lot of the oncology drugs, especially the, the, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors are negative inotropes, so there's lots of concern about heart failure. And so the FDA has attempted to help sponsors get through this development, their development plans with some idea of what's going to happen with patients who have cardiac disease. What, do you, what happens to a patient who has antecedent heart failure, for example, or a person who has some conduction system disease? Are they a particular liability? Mm -hmm. And I think, I think that it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity to make drugs safe. Again, the problem is that it adds tremendously to the cost. And... Uh, and sometimes these development programs can get drawn out because of the of the need to get o to get over the safety issue. Gotcha. So I'm going to take advantage of your deep knowledge in this area. Just throw a few questions at you. If if you don't want to answer them, you don't have to. But I find a real problem now is the these these uh, the uh, direct oral anticoagulants and their theoretical interaction. Because a lot of every time I want to put someone on one of those. Uh, like a pixaban or rivaroxaban, and they happen to be on uh, something like, for example, one of the other antirhythmics, it says don't do it or do it cautiously. 
but that's just based on some theoretical things, right? So can you t give some give some guidelines to the, to to your members out there? Uh, what are you doing? I mean, I'm never quite sure what to do with that. Yeah, it's it's actually almost comical when you when, uh, we have Epic and you know these things that come up on the screen. It, yeah, that's right. It, you know, it's called it's called uh, warning fatigue. Right. You know, you, after a right. while, you don't even look at the warning anymore. Right. Like, Hell with it. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So, so are you do are you doing something? Uh, like well. There are some interactions that are actually important and some that are not nearly as important, even on theoretical grounds. For example, all the action, interactions with amiodarone are really not all that powerful. I mean, they're, yes, you need to be somewhat careful, and yes, you need to maybe take, some, take account of what you're doing with the NOAC, but in general terms, most of the time, amiodarone interactions, even though they come up on the EPIC screen, aren't as important. The problem is, the big problem, Eric, with the NOACs is that we can't measure anything. Right. So if you put somebody on a drug and it, suppose, and it has a drug interaction because of a CYP3A or a PGP interactions, which are the most, the most frequent, and you're sitting there thinking, have I just over anticoagulated this person with the Pixaban or with Rivaroxaban? It would be great if you could just get, I'm not saying that we monitor the patients all, like we do with right. Warfarin, but if you could just get one measurement and right. say, no, they're fine. I don't have to worry about that anymore. It would take all this away, but right. unfortunately, since we don't have a metric, it really increases everybody's angst about this. But to be honest about it, the, you, what you implied in your question is it's not as big a problem as it makes as they make it sound. That's correct. It's not as big a clinical problem, but you can't completely ignore it either. Yeah, I got you. So maybe a person that you're not worried about a major bleed, they don't have as high a Hasbrad score or something. Right. You might just go with the flow. Yeah, and then the old elderly, fragile patient, you might say, well, maybe that's a good reason to give them the lower dose of a right. Pixaban. So I'm going to ask you um, one other thing that comes up all the time again, and I'm part of the problem on this one, I admit it. When we wrote the first uh, guidelines for AFib, uh, based on the CAST study, which many of our members won't even know what it is, <laughs> they'll think it's some orthopedic problem, right? So based on the For CAST study, leg, right, yeah. broken leg study, um, though the, we said in coronary disease, we advised against use of, uh, of flecainide or propafenone. But I didn't mean that to mean, we never meant it to mean if somebody has a calcium scan and they have a, a 50 score. So there has to be some rationale here, right? Um, my philosophy, but I'd like to hear yours, has been if you've had active coronary disease, I avoid the drugs. But if somebody came to you and they did a calcium scan and, uh, and it was positive, that's, I assume that that's not kicking no. them out in your opinion. So you no. agree, they actually have to have coronary disease. Yeah, and, and if you're on the fence about it, I mean, you can always do a functional test to make sure they're not ischemic on the treadmill. I mean, that's always a nice right. way of, of sort of proving the point. But yes, I, I completely agree. People have gotten very concerned not only when they have documentation of a calcium score, but somebody's in a coronary age group. You know, well, this is a 60-year-old guy who lives in the United States. He must have coronary disease. Right. I better not use this drug. That's probably getting a little bit too far on the caution and, side. And it's all, as you and I talked about before, it's, it's basically trial creep because the trial <laughs> was post in my patients. Absolutely. And now we're taking it. So that's good to hear you feel the same way because yeah, people are very interested in their health and they're getting all these tests on their own and they're coming to you with it. So I'm glad you're here, you're doing what I, when I know that you're doing what I'm doing, I feel much better. Well, Peter, thank you so much for coming. It's great Eric, to have you on the show. it's always a pleasure to see you. Great, thanks. Thank you.